Lord, as we turn to your word now, I just pray that you would bless your word, Father, that you would open up our hearts to receive all that you would give us this morning, Lord, for you have been that great big giving God, Lord. You're the one who rules our hearts, Father. So we turn it up to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 5 this morning. Sorry. 1 Samuel chapter 5. <clears throat> I really wasn't sure all of this week how to approach this chapter 5, but um, hopefully we'll do alright. I just felt on Friday that the Lord had given me finally a message. It was a bit last minute, but we got there. We saw the last time we looked into 1 Samuel in chapter 4, it was a real desperate time for Israel. They had been totally defeated by the Philistines, they lost 30,000 men in the battlefield. The high priest had died. Eli, when he was told that the Ark of the Covenant had been captured by the Philistines, he fell backwards off his seat and broke his neck and died. His sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they also died. They were of the priestly line. So there was really, in some measure, no one to take over the priesthood, or the high priesthood, except Samuel. We found as well that this young woman who was Phineas's wife, she was pregnant and she was so shocked at the death of her husband and her father-in-law and her brother-in-law and the loss of the ark and the defeat of Israel that she went into premature labour and she gave birth to a son. And she was so downcast and defeated that she literally turned her face to the wall and she died. But before she died, she said, call the boy Ichabod. For the glory has departed. God's glory has departed from Israel. And really at the end of the day, God's glory never departs. When men will let him down, God's glory will shine forth. I often pray with people and when I do pray with them, I say to them, you know, don't expect things to get better right away. Because often in the case that God will just sweep the table clean. And then he'll start building things the way he wants it done. He doesn't want any of our man-made structures left in our lives. He wants, he wants to be the architect, the planner, the project manager, the builder. He wants to do it all. He wants to do it all for us. Yes, he wants us to be partnerships in it. and We, want, we have to be open to that. But he's the one who does the building. And that's exactly, to me, what was happening with Israel here. They had lost their way. They were totally spiritually bankrupt. They were economically bankrupt. The Philistines, the Ammonites, the Amorites, all around them. The enemy was closing in. The Philistines had just given them a major defeat and now they were at the bottom and about to be rebuilt. There was no, as far as they could see, no glory left in Israel at all. And so that's where we start at the start of chapter 5. When the Ark of the Covenant has been captured by the Philistines, <coughs> And they take it as a trophy back into their own territory. And so at verse 1 it says, After the Philistines had captured the Ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. And it's quite interesting there, of course, that Ebenezer means that my God is with me. And the people of Israel are crying, my God is not with me. You know, sometimes we get into that situation where God has to discipline us. Not in a, not in a, an overt sense, but in the sense that when we step out in the wrong direction, he will allow the consequences of that wrong direction to come back in us, not because he hates us, but because he loves us, to allow us to learn the lesson, to allow us to see that God is the one who needs to be in control. The ways of a man seem fine to a man, but in the end, the end in death. That's what the psalmist says. That was a paraphrase of it. So then they carried the ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. But the following morning at verse 4, when they rose, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. That is why to this day neither the priests of Dagon nor any of the others who entered Dagon's temple, Ashdod, step on the threshold. On their way back to 
Ashdod, one of the cities of the Philistines, and we'll see the rest of them as we, as we come along through this chapter and the next chapter. As they were coming back, Psalm 78 and Jeremiah 7 tells us that actually, before they returned to Ashdod, <coughs> they'd actually carried on and destroyed Shiloh. They destroyed the place where the tabernacle was placed. And uh, many died in that situation as well. So the Philistines here were jubilant. They would march back to Ashdod with this Ark of the Covenant, this great symbol of God's presence among the Israelites. A great battle trophy. Who would not take it? This was what the Israelites had put their trust in. They hadn't put their trust in the God of the Ark, they'd put their trust in the Ark of the God. And that is the wrong way around. It was some sort of lucky charm that they decided to use the Ark of the Covenant. It was a, a last ditch, a last throw of the dice, if you want to call it that. So these, these Philistines were quite confident in Dagon's superiority over the Israelite god Yahweh. Now this Dagon, I don't know whether you've ever seen pictures of Dagon, but it's like a man standing up with his arms out held like so. But instead of having legs, he's got a fish's tail. And it stretches out behind him. If you go and do a search online, you'll find pictures of Dagon. And, and he stood like this, with his tail kind of swinging around here and his body. And this was supposed to be their great uh, fertility god. It was once again another one of these gods that had to be placated. They had to offer sacrifices and they had to offer sort of even blood sacrifices, children, etc., in order to placate this God so that this God, Dagon, would be good to them. His name, Dagon, means son of Baal. In the Old Testament, Baal is the New Testament Satan. So in some measure we see this is a real spiritual battle. As it is today for Israel, it's the son of Satan that's up against them. It's the, it's the Philistines, the Palestinians are today the descendants of the Philistines and we find the same situation there. So Dagon falls down before the Ark of the Covenant. Now, is God in the Ark of the Covenant? No. Is it a symbol of his presence? Yes. Should another God stand up in the presence of the living God? No. So Dagon falls down. And at this point, the Philistines, rather than responding by saying, oh, wait a minute. This is a great and holy God, this God of the Israelites. We better submit to this God. No, they put the other God back up. It was just an accident. It was just an incident. It was a one-off. I don't know who actually wrote this, and I don't know who gave them the story, but we're given this sort of fly-in-the-wall uh, view of what was happening in the Temple of Dagon. And I dread to think what was happening in the Temple of Dagon that night as the Shekinah glory of God shone in that place and that big stone idol fell down before him. So Dagon falls down and for the second night they put him up and again he falls down again. But the threshold of the door, well most people have got a threshold in their door which is a little step that stands up and it's got an edge on it. So it would appear that Dagon had fallen down and his hands, his wrists had caught across the threshold and burst them, broken them off. And so these Philistines rather than again say, well it can't be coincidental two nights in a row. And it can't be coincidental that the hands have broken off because obviously the hands are the, are the what would you say, the, 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 the means through which somebody would work. I mean, most of us work through our hands. If we're handling something, if we want to do something, if we want to cook, even if we want to pray, sometimes we use our hands. So hands are a very important part of what you would call normal life. But rather than sort of say, well, we better get rid of Dagon and worship the God of the Israelites. They decide that they're going to make another superstition out of this. That because the hands broke off in the threshold of the door, nobody was allowed to stand in the threshold of the door after that because Dagon had touched it. I know that it sounds crazy. And it is, you know, when I was reading this, I was kind of laughing a bit because I thought, you know, this is the kind of crazy things that men get up to. They make up superstitions to suit themselves so rather than respond to his greatness the Philistines make a superstition out of it and you know 
men are like that all the time. I mean, what do we do? Touch wood? You know, it's a, it's a superstition. It's one of these things, you know, that cross my heart and hope to die. You know, these are all superstitious mumbo jumbo, but it gets quite bad when you get to the stage in, in the Roman Catholic Church where they're praying to bits of saints. You know, there are various cathedrals around Europe who have got the fingernail of Saint Columba or the or the pinky of Saint Augustine or something, and, and they and they pray these bits that that God will intervene for them, and in some measure it makes them no better than the Philistines with their superstitions. Neither does it make them any better than the Israelites who thought that taking the Ark of the Covenant out to battle would be their good luck charm. We go through all the rituals every day within and I don't mean to be I've got no time for the Roman Catholic religion but I've got every time for the Catholics there. They need to be saved. They need to hear the truth of what God's saying to them. But they go through a lot of superstitious ritual. If you go to confession and say ten Hail Marys and five of your fathers then your sins will be forgiven and that has to be on a daily basis. And yet Christ died once for all. It's superstition. It's, it's, it's nonsense. Either Christ died once for all or he didn't. There's even a situation arises within the Baptist tradition that you're not actually saved until you're baptised. And that's not right either. You're saved the moment that Jesus comes into your heart. The moment that you accept that forgiveness for sin. The moment that you want to be born again. Yes, baptism is good because Jesus asks us to be baptised. Of course he does. But it's not an absolute necessity. If you want an example, then obviously the thief on the cross is the prime example. No chance for him to be baptised. Only, only enough time for him to repent of his sin. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Because he knew his heart. You know, and even when I'm looking at today when we're going to come to the, the elements and share communion, I'm thinking about all the superstition around taking communion. The taking of communion is linked to salvation. That's why, you know, when I used to be part of the Church of Scotland, the communion services, which I think were four times a year, that was why they were so busy, because people thought that if they came in and celebrated communion then that would be them they would be set up that would be their that would be their sins forgiven for another little while and I remember <clears throat> the first time Donny and I went to Israel we tagged on to the back end of a Church of Scotland tour that was moving out of Glasgow and when we went there for those of you who have been and the number have been with us since then up at the, the, the Mount of the Beatitudes they wanted to do communion. And we were all dressed in shorts and t-shirts and stuff like that. Because it was hot. It was a hot day. And the two ministers for the Church of Scotland who were there, who were leading the party, we were just kind of back-enders. They disappeared and I thought, well, I wonder where they're going. And then they appeared in this boiling hot day with all their clergy and gear on and their dog collars and all the kit. Because they couldn't, they weren't allowed to celebrate communion unless they were properly dressed, unless they were shown that due reverence for it. I mean, it's just totally invalid. I mean, where does that come from? It comes from man's ideas. It comes from superstition. It comes from some sort of, I mean, why could people not just celebrate communion the way it was meant to be celebrated? Jesus celebrated it with his disciples. Just as 12 guys sitting there, this is my blood shed for you, this is my body broken for you. Now, please don't think I'm having a real crack at these people. That's the way they've been taught. They've wandered away from the world. They've lost the idea of this freedom that you have in Jesus Christ. That nobody can celebrate communion unless it's somebody up here or somebody with letters after their name, or letters before their name. It's just a superstition. It's just a man-made thing that keeps power in the hands of the people who are at the top. 
You know, they carried the Ark of the Covenant off the battlefield and into Ekron, but God doesn't need men to carry him around. He carries us. He carries us on a daily basis. As I said before, when sometimes when men are a, di- a disgrace to God, we think, oh, what's going to happen now? God is impotent. But I'm telling you this morning, I want to encourage you, God will not be mocked. God will glorify himself. And God will glorify himself in every way that he can. That Shekinah glory that dwelt over the ark when the ark was in the tabernacle, when the ark was in the temple, that Shekinah glory dwells in you who know Christ as Lord and Saviour. And so the glory of God dwells in you. God will glorify himself through you even although we're flawed vessels. Even although we lack God will make up the lack if we are prepared to put our trust in him. Israel were being brought to that stage here where they were going to have to turn back to God. They had lost it completely. They had wandered away from the word of God. They had allowed the traditions of men to take over the glory of God. And God would not stand for it. If God's glory is in you, then the natural progression is that God's holiness is in you as well because he told us that be you holy for I am holy and that's hard to understand isn't it that that we can stand here this morning and think Lord how can you even contemplate the fact that I am holy because it's his holiness and it's his glory and it's nothing to do with us all we have to do is receive Christ died on that cross that his holiness and his glory might dwell within us. And we need to accept that as a fact. Not as some sort of superstitious thing that we have to do this or do that or perform this ritual or wear a dog collar or whatever. That glory, that Shekinah glory that is still evident in the world today shines from us in God's holiness. And I want to get that across to you this morning. Because the Israelites couldn't understand why God had deserted them, but God hadn't deserted them. They had deserted God. If you're standing in a place this morning where, where sin is prevalent in your life, don't expect God to honour it. We need to be a repentant people. A people who stand up and say, Lord, I've got this wrong. Please sort it for me. Get it right. But then I thought, what what happens then if the ungodly lay their hands on the things that are godly? The answer is explained in this next little passage here. The Lord's hand was heavy upon the people of Ashdod at verse 5 in its vicinity. He brought devastation on them and afflicted them with tumours. When the people of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not stay here with us, because his hand is heavy on us and on Dagon our God. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and asked them, what shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? The Philistines who refused to honour God, they were afflicted with tumours. Now we're, we don't know exactly what these are, but in the research that I've done, it seems to have been, and I don't wish to put anybody off, but it seems to have been mainly in the groin or in the back passage. It was like some huge hemorrhoid that just kind of grew. It was, many say, because there were rats mentioned later in chapter 6, in the back end of chapter 5, that it was actually bubonic plague that these people were cursed with. And then people say to me, but, but bubonic plague, you know, They've got all these ships coming in from Greece with their weapons and their artillery, etc., their iron chariots. There would be loads of rats on these ships which would come ashore. And and it was just a pure chance. It was just a chance thing that these people were struck with this plague. Well, God's known the business of chance. He doesn't do chance. And chance and good luck and bad luck and all of these things in some measure, they're only a, a method. If you want to call it that, chance is a, is a mathematical method of being able to work out what the probability of something happening or not happening is. 
That's what Jan says. So don't think this was some chance affliction. It was a judgment by God and a people who showed no respect for the things of God or the people of God. When I was working, I used to run a small engineering subcontract shop doing turning and milling and bits and pieces. Alec will know the type of place. He worked in them all these years. And there was a guy who was really kind of standing against me and speaking to all my customers and bad-mouthing me and all the rest of it. And I lost a bit of business to it through no fault of mine. And I don't even know why the guy, whether it was jealousy or what, I really don't know. But he spoke against me. And I was, I was a Christian at that time and a relatively new Christian. And I thought, Lord, what is going to happen here? What, what are we doing here? Within three weeks of that, the guy was dead. Now, I'm not saying that God killed him. But I prayed about that. And for the ungodly who were standing against those who were godly, God did his business. God took care of his business. And I say that to you this morning. When the enemy comes against you, you fear not. God will stand for you. Even in this situation where the Israelites had totally deserted them, God was still in the business of standing for the Israelites. He completely incapacitated the Philistine army because of this plague he'd put upon them. And yet we've no record at all that this plague spread to the Israelites. And I would like to think it's the same thing that happened with the bubonic plague in Europe. That the Jews in Europe, I don't know, I think I've probably told you this before, but the Jews in Europe were blamed for the bubonic plague in Europe during the, the, the medieval times. And they were blamed because there were so many of them actually managed to survive it and not catch the plague. But the difference was, when we look back on it now, God had given the Jews a hygienic and dietary laws. And when they stuck to them, then very few of them actually got infected with bubonic plague. The rats weren't in their house because their houses were clean. Their food was well prepared and kept prepared. That it wasn't allowed to go off. They weren't eating meat that was, that was damaged. They weren't eating things. I mean, we eat lots of pork today, but pork is one of, probably one of the most dangerous meats you can eat. It's one of these things. Cook it properly, or if you don't, don't eat it, because you could get real serious problems with pork. Anyway, now that I've cheered you up. Um, <laughs> but that was the situation, and that's the situation I, I find here that Israel, although they had deserted God in a spiritual sense, they were still adhering to his dietary and his hygienic laws. And therefore they were protected in some measure against this plague. If we're standing in our own place with God, then God will discipline us. And he said that. And, 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 and quite rightly, God will forgive our sin. Yes, he does. But because of our sin, we may have to suffer the consequences. Sometimes God deals with the consequences. Sometimes he allows the consequences to run through our life as a lesson to us. But have no fear because he never, ever deserts you. He's never far away. How many times do we hear when people have an affliction in their life that they blame God? Even the ungodly. Why would God do this? And I say, well, I thought you didn't believe in God. So why are you blaming him? I think somewhere in everybody there's this little bit that, that believes that there is something after death. So they answered, this was the Philistines when they asked, what shall we do with the ark of God? They answered, have the ark of God of Israel moved to Gath? So they moved the ark of God of Israel. So they passed it on for Ash God to Gath. Here, you guys have it for a while. You know, we're not interested. You take it. But after they had moved it, verse 9, the Lord's hand was against that city, throwing it into a great panic. He afflicted the people of the city, both young and old, with an outbreak of tumours. So they sent the Ark of God to Ekron. That's one of the other cities of the Philistines. It was like past the parcel in the Belfast Arms here. And it was like <laughs> the Ark of God was entering Ekron, and the people of Ekron cried out, They have brought the Ark of God of Israel around to us to kill us and our people. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and said, Send the ark of God of Israel away. Let it go back to its own place, or it will kill us and our people. 
for death had filled the city with panic. God's hand was very heavy on it, and those who did not die were afflicted with tumours, and the outcry of the city went up to heaven. Dealing with that many dead bodies at any one time, the place would be an absolute death trap for many diseases. Maybe bubonic plague had kicked it off, but the ongoing effect of typhus and typhoid and all these other things would take their, take their toll as well, as well. It was a terrible affliction on the Philistines. Many will say, look, it was not God that did it, or it was not God that allowed it to happen. It was just, as I said earlier, bad luck or chance. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't believe anything in this world happens by chance. That the God that I serve is a God who has his hand over all things, even although the place may seem to be in chaos, God knows what he's doing with it all. All things are ordered by God and they are allowed by God. So you say, well, chance, well, you know, if you took a 10 pence piece out of your pocket and tossed it in the air, what's the chance of coming down heads? One and two, 50-50. So it really is a mathematical probability. And you flip it up, will it come down heads every time? So what's the odds of it coming down five heads and four tails and then three heads and one tail? There are so many circumstances that govern even just the flipping of a coin. We could talk about air pressure, we could talk about humidity, we could talk about the speed with which I throw it up, we could talk about the fact that whether I catch it and turn it or allow it to hit the ground and bounce and, and roll over. And yet, the probability, the chance is 50-50 that will come down heads or tails. That's it. And that, in some measure... I know I'm going to go off on a rabbit trail here in a minute, but you know, when we look at God, God works in the here and the now and the real. We've got people in this world, the evolutionists who work on probability. The chance of something happening, that something just happened by chance. I mean, they find one bone and they build a whole big animal out of it. And they say, this animal probably lived 60 million years ago. Probably. Well, probably and probability are no far away from each other. But the probability of them actually bringing any sense to it is nonsense. Because they have nothing to base it on. They're making a, a mathematical statement based on nothing. At least with a coin, when you toss it up, there's only two sides to it. It's got to come down one side or the other. But it might, as I say, it might come down five in a row heads. It might come down 25 in a row heads. Who knows? But it's got to come down heads or tails. But for the evolutionary point of view, there are so many varied circumstances that it's almost impossible, in fact it is impossible, to accept that evolution as the way forward. I mean, I've said this before, here's these smartphones that we've got nowadays. It's absolutely, it's absolutely ludicrous. People would laugh at you if you said that that phone just, well, it just happened. It's just by chance. And this is not even a living object. This is just an inanimate object. This is something that has developed, yes, over the years. But it's not something that has just suddenly appeared over the years. God is at work in all things. And he handles all the circumstances. He brings all things together for good to those that love him and are called according to his purpose. Probably in the Old Testament there are about 300 and odd prophecies signifying that Jesus Christ would be the Messiah. That the Messiah would fulfill all of these prophecies. Out of those 300 and odd there are probably 60 major ones. And out of the 60 major ones there are probably 8 really major ones. Like having to be born in Bethlehem, having to be born in a virgin, etc, etc, etc if you look at it and the mathematicians have done the figures in this the chance of Jesus not being the Messiah and they only looked at eight of the prophecies 
And they worked out a mathematical model against the scripture, against who mentioned what in scripture and who mentioned timelines, etc. I don't want to get into all that at the moment. But eight major prophecies for Jesus Christ. If Jesus had to fulfil all eight major prophecies, the Messianic prophecies, then the odds were one in ten to the seventeenth. In other words, one with seventeen, nothing's behind it. It was so close to being one that Jesus had to be the Messiah. He was the only one in whom it was all fulfilled. The probability is one. It has to be him. It can't be anything else. It's like your DNA thing. Now, you ask me, 1 times 10 to 17, that's a big number. So how does that relate? Well, let me tell you this. If you took the whole of Great Britain and you took 50 pence pieces and covered the whole of Great Britain 10 feet deep, that would be 1 times 10 to the 17, 50 pence pieces. Now, if you want to work out the probability of it, then you take a blind man and you put him in the top of this pile of coins and you've got one coin out of all of those that's got a black mark on it. And this blind man wanders around and picks up that one coin. That's the probability of Jesus not being the Messiah. So there's no such thing as chance. God has got chance worked out all over the place. I mean, even if you look at lottery winners and all the rest of it, they think they won these things by chance, but God governs the circumstances. So we'll look at that from the point of view that when people say, oh, it just happened by chance, chance is only a mathematical tool. It's a probability study. That's all it is. We go back to the coin. You could flip coins all day. They're never going to come down anything other than heads or tails. That's it. And we're never going to get another Messiah except Jesus Christ. So, I just wanted to to encourage in that, that these people, these Israelites who were being afflicted, who were, who had lost their men in battle, who had had the ark captured from them, who had lost their high priest, who had lost the priesthood through Phineas and Hophni, these people who thought that the glory had departed, God was at work in amongst the enemies. He was in amongst the enemies. He was clearing the tables. He was clearing the tabletop. And then he was going to say to Israel, look at me. Look at me, Israel. Get your heads lifted and look at me because today I'm going to do a new thing amongst you. So, as we turn to this Lord's table now, let's remember that this is not some chance occurrence, some magical ritual, as some people would have it. It's a simple memorial that those who have accepted Jesus Christ as a saviour, who have had their sins forgiven, can be assured as they take this that their sins are forgiven. It's a memorial unto the Lord. Whether we use wine and a slice of plain bread whether we use a bottle of iron brew and a packet of crisps or whether we do as we do and we use juice and matzah it makes no difference it doesn't matter what the elements are it's what the elements represent and it's to do with the heart of those who are giving it and those who are receiving it and the heart of God is to you and your heart should be to him and this is an intimate memorial a memorial where we can actually say to the Lord, Lord, this glass of iron brew, this crisp, they're maybe the common things of the world, but Lord, they remind me of sin forgiven. And I thank you for that. It's not how we use it, it's not how we dress, it's not the special prayers that we say, it's not whether we have letters after our name or letters before our name, it's about the heart of the man and woman who accepts this reminder that indeed sins are forgiven and sins will always be forgiven 